We experience sentiments and ties to the past on a regular basis. The past is difficult to let go of, and it has an emotional impact on us. So how can we let go of the past, forgetting about the past so that we may focus on the future? How can we let go of our guilt, our actions, and the injustices that have been committed to us? We won't be able to change the past, but we will be able to learn from it. The past exists to help you train, develop, and mold yourself into a person God wants you to be right now. If you don't learn from your mistakes, you will remain angry, resentful, and worse, you will be wistful for the good old days. Living in the past is a difficulty because it requires you to see God rather than yourself and all of your mistakes or other people's failures. Instead of being concerned about God failing to provide for your future, you should be concerned about what your future might be like without Him. According to the Bible, what wicked fear will come to pass, therefore we should be afraid of leaving God out of our future plans, rather than having a hard time trusting God's plan for us. You can't predict the future, but you can learn about the person who is in charge of it, God. You become scared, domineering, and selfish if you don't trust God. We are delighted and anticipate great things when we trust God. The next task is not to be fearful, but to have greater faith in God. How much do you put your faith in God for your future? I find that the more difficult life becomes, the more I want to be in charge of it. Consider what the Bible says about the past in Hebrews 12, verse 11. We do not enjoy being disciplined. It is painful at the time, but later, after we have learned from it, we have peace because we start living in the right way. In the past, before we were born again, we were devil's children and were separated from God. We were dead in our sins and facing everlasting punishment. We were imprisoned in sin before we were born again and on our way to the eternal fire and eternal alienation from our Creator God. We have become children of God and joint heirs with Christ because we were rescued by the grace through our faith. We now have the assurance of everlasting life, spiritual kingship, and an inheritance set apart for us in high realms. This is a tremendous promise to you today. No matter what condemnation you have faced in the past, Focus on the great plan that your Heavenly Father has for you. Quit focusing on the past. He has your best interests at heart, and thus your future is secure. Having God as your Father and Christ as your teacher is a blessing and an honor. But with tremendous blessing comes great duty. You are asked to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's adopted child. You will waste the present by being unfocused and reacting if you don't learn from how God has moved in the past and if you don't trust God with the future. The Bible encourages us to turn our attention away from ourselves and our issues, including our past, and onto God, as well as to appreciate our limits as a blessing. We must unclutter our hearts, focus our prayers, and understand clearly what God is asking us to accomplish with our life in order to shift our emphasis. And give my son Solomon an uncluttered and focused heart so that he can obey what you command, live by your directions and counsel, and carry through with building the temple for which I have provided. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 19. Do you enjoy going fishing? The prospect of catching the big one may make your heart race. I know how much I like fishing with my kids. It's always a fantastic time. However, in Mark 1, verse 17, we find Jesus' comments on fishing. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men, the scripture says. Jesus' transformation into a man fisherman indicated that he would utilize his disciples to expand God's kingdom. God has something bigger in mind for Andrew and Simon in the future. They were to stop doing what they had been doing for their entire lives and let go of their pasts. Are you ready to let go of that past to which you are so clinging to? Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. 
Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. You may be overly attached to your acquaintances, with the majority of them holding you back, but you are hesitant to take the first step to move on from them. You may have been horribly hurt in the past by someone you truly trusted, and you have been suspicious of everyone God brings your way. You may have lost your spouse, son, daughter, or a parent in a tragic accident and have been unable to move on. You may have been wrongfully charged and sentenced for something you never committed, and as a result, you are unable to obtain a decent employment, mortgage, or loan. You have the impression that your life has been trapped in a bubble. Today, Christ invites you to cast all of your worries on Him. Are you ready to let go of everything today and follow Him? Take the step that the two men took and follow Him today. He is something better for you. God calls us regardless of where we are or what we have done in the past. Simon and Andrew were out on the water fishing. You may be at church, at work, or outgoing about your business. Jesus desires for us to assist him in bringing people into the kingdom. We don't need to be socialites or rich to participate. Just like Simon and Andrew did when they laid down their nets and followed Jesus, we must love him and obey him. For you to be a modern day fisherman, you must broaden your horizons and explore beyond the bubble in which you live. You must look past whatever has happened in the past. Your life's purpose changes, and you realize that human values are becoming more essential than monetary prosperity. He is something better for you, more valuable than money or fame. What are the consequences of being trapped in the past? What happens if you are unable to reconcile your past? What if you are unable to respond to God's call because you are bound by your past? I've got some bad news for you. If you can't let go of your past, you're doomed. Take, for example, the story of Lot's wife. Her name is not given in the Bible. She is simply referred to as Lot's wife in Genesis 19, verse 26, although Jews refer to her as Adith or Irith. Many commentators believe Lot's wife was a resident of Sodom, which would explain her desire for the city and its inhabitants as well as her turning to watch its destruction and turning into a pillar of salt. God commanded Lot and his family not to look back in Genesis 19, verse 17. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. According to the Bible, Lot's wife remained behind amid the haste to leave Sodom. We make a sincere attempt to stand by Christ's side when we make the decision to follow him. As time passes, though, we may find ourselves falling back into our old habits and company. She did, however, linger behind before returning her gaze to the metropolis. She was struck dead as a result of her reluctance and disobedience, and her grace period expired. Despite the fact that Lot was caught up in the immoral state of Sodom, his steadfast retreat eventually saved him from destruction. There is no such thing as a half-saved or half-lost provision. There is no middle ground when it comes to our faith. Either we are faithful or we're not. Most Christians, like Lot's wife, have struggled to come to terms with their history. Perhaps you were an addict, and despite attending seminars and promising God to leave drugs, you still sneak and take a few sniffs or puffs of that secret drug. Perhaps you promised God to leave the company of that bad friend, but you still sneak notes to them or see them in secret. Perhaps you promised God to leave sexual immorality, but you always slip back and make the same mistake, and so on. God wants you to be able to let go of the past and make peace with it because he has something better in mind for you. You can choose to follow Lot's example and never look back, saving yourself from devastation. God always saves his faithful. He won't let that situation overwhelm you. He has something better for you.
Paul was a well-to-do, highly respected, high-ranking Pharisee who despised and persecuted Christians in his previous life. God threw him from his high horse, blinded him, and showed himself to Paul one day on the way to Damascus with authorization in his hands to imprison saints. All of that pride vanished in a single God shot. Then came the true anguish. Here's what Paul had to say about his life in Philippians. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3 verse 8. That's a powerful statement. Everything, surpassing, all, and rubbish were among the words used. When he wrote this, he was imprisoned. Philippians is a letter full of gladness and happiness, as well as encouragement to believers to do the same. It is time for you to make peace with your terrible history, like Paul did, and choose to completely serve God today. Paul's story shows us that no past is too hard for God to forgive. He is a forgiving Father. He is a God of second chances. Do not be guided by guilt, but confess to Him today, and He will take that heavy yoke off your shoulders and make you whole again. He has something bigger for you. Let's be candid. Tests are hard. And by tests, I mean life's tests. Those moments no one prepares for, but which prepares for you. That hour that has the potential to crush you, yet possesses the same power to elevate you. I mean that test. Just like school or work, there are peculiar times when tests will be given. Although they look the same, life's tests work differently. They play by a different set of rules. For instance, you can't tell when it will come. I've never met someone who can tell me they knew of a test before it came. Someone might have a premonition or even a revelation, but it ends there. No one truly really knows when or what their tests may be. Yet, life's tests come with great benefits. When you face them, they never leave you the same. But when you don't, you may lose it all. Here's what I wish to tell you today, my dear friend. As you journey through life every day, you are supposed to, according to the blueprint of God, be on a course to fulfill a predefined destiny existing before you were born a destiny whose full extent is only known by God and unveiled to us through each progressive stride. God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You aren't someone heading towards just about any direction. You are actually born to be a somebody going somewhere to happen. Ponder on that for a moment. Maybe no one has ever told you this before. Maybe you have come to accept yourself as a nobody who doesn't count. You're not just an addition to the numbers, one more mouth to feed or whatever. You are important to God, to the world, and to God's agenda on earth. In fact, your life plays an important role in bringing God's plan to pass. That is why you didn't die. That's why the thing that has killed others maimed many Destroyed others have not been able to touch you. It's not as if they don't matter too. It's just that. Right now, you are preserved for this moment because of God's mercy and your place in his plan. One of my favorite verses of scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you and plans to give you hope and a future. Now, as you begin to live your life one day at a time, you begin to know God and know his purpose for your life. Now, you know Jesus. Now you have learned to trust him for the things you need. Then in faith, you develop strong expectations and it begins to appear like things aren't working the way you want them to. It seems when you believe God for something, that's when other things go out of course. 
It seems there's a blockade to your progress each time an opportunity is to come. Can you relate with what I am saying? You see, between the day that God gives you a vision to believe for and the day it comes, there is the factor of time and there is the factor of the fight. Let me explain this further so you will get it. What is a breakthrough? It is a miracle, an experience that is beyond your working, but that changes your current situation from worse to better. A breakthrough is a change of status through a mind-blowing experience. Breakthroughs in science have led to safe childbirths, decreased mortalities, higher life expectancy, more safer surgeries, and lots more. Breakthroughs in science and technology has led so many good things that has made life better for countless numbers of people the world over. A breakthrough takes away frustration. A breakthrough will bring satisfaction to labor. A breakthrough is like a breath of fresh air. A breakthrough ends the struggle, the waste, the pains, and so much more. Many of us live our lives pursuing what we are pursuing, working our hands off, simply because we want to have a breakthrough, if not for ourselves, but for our kids, for their future. However, breakthroughs don't just come. They don't just happen. If they happen so easily, they wouldn't be so special, would they now? Everyone doesn't have a breakthrough. That's why everyone wants it. For you, the Christian, the one who has put their faith in Jesus, your breakthrough is that experience that comes after the storm. It is that experience that gives you a testimony, that makes you a testimony. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. It is an experience that will make you forget the pains of the past, an experience that swallows the past. When Sarah held the boy Isaac in her arms and said, all who laughed at me will now laugh with me. She was talking about a breakthrough. This one miracle would take away all the mockery of childlessness that she's had to endure all her life. That child was a breakthrough. What about Joseph? When the Pharaoh made that decree to have him elevated to the status of a prime minister, that was a breakthrough. Joseph had held on to the vision, the dream he had from the beginning. Even while in prison, he knew that he did not belong there. He knew that more awaited him. His future was not going to be something he would achieve by strength or skill. He knew he was no warrior, no royalty. But that one day, something would happen that would make men bow to him. How that would happen, he didn't know, but he was ready to see it come to pass. That was why he told the king's cupbearer in Genesis 40, 14 through 15, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. In other words, Joseph was saying, I don't belong here. I belong somewhere better. Mention me to the Pharaoh. It would take some time before the cupbearer would remember Joseph, but he did. And when he did, it was a change of status. It was a breakthrough for Joseph. It was a breakthrough for his dreams. It was a breakthrough for his family, a breakthrough for his time because Joseph would go on to save the lives of many. Are you going through a difficult time in your life? What if it's the test that precedes your breakthrough? Remember what Joseph had to go through before he reached his breakthrough. He faced hatred and betrayal from his own brothers. He was thrown into a well and later sold into slavery by the same. In the house of Potiphar, things seemed a little better until the lady of the house framed him and a false accusation that landed him in trouble. You see, Joseph had a choice when Potiphar's wife asked him to lie with her. His future would depend on whatever choice he made. If he chose to lie with her, he probably would be promoted, but to the highest point of chief servant and nothing more than that. This was a test. What would Joseph choose? How did he weigh his destiny? Was sleeping with this woman going to give him that? Or was there more? 
Thank God that Joseph held on to his belief in more. He turned her down. And though it seemed like things went from bad to worse, Joseph would later learn that this was the best decision he had to make. It cost him his freedom. It cost him his peace, his friendships, his job. But he held on. My friend, you're going through a test right now because your breakthrough is near. In fact, it is closer than you think. Between Jesus and a glorious resurrection were the hours of his passion, the highest form of pain a living being could be subject to. He would be tortured, disgraced, stripped of everything, and abandoned by all he cared for. At a point, he asked the Father to take that cup away, and because he was subject to God's will, he submitted to it. And see what Paul the Apostle would go on to write about the sacrifice of our beloved Master and Savior in Philippians 2, 6 through 9. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing to take the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Before his crown, as the highest, was the cross. He went through his darkest so he would shine as the brightest. He went through his lowest so he would become the highest. The world may tell you that you are going through what you are going through because you are a failure or you committed some offense or whatever. However, hear me. In Jesus Christ, everything, including the things you once did in the past, is turned into your advantage today. You don't have to see it or feel it. You just have to believe it. In believing, you will rest. In resting in faith, you will sail through the storm. And in sailing through your storm, you will appear on the other side. They say that the darkest hour is the hour before dawn. It makes sense because you see, things get tough before they get better. The exams, the tests that you take for higher institutions or promotions are not cheap tests. They make you work yourself hard to pass. They exhaust you. They make you think long and hard. They make you go the extra mile to prepare to pass them. It's never easy. The rigorous preparations, the sweat, the pressure. But you know what? Once you pass it, you've passed it. There is no going back. So do not give up now. You have come too far. Imagine if Sarah had quitted because she was being mocked. We wouldn't have had Isaac. If Joseph had quit, what would have become of the nation and all the people he saved during the famine? What would have become of this sweet salvation we so greatly rejoice in if our dear Lord Jesus had given up when his passion was starting or during his darkest hour? We would have nothing. There's so many counting on you more than you are even aware of right now. Your test does not come because you did anything wrong. No, divorce that notion. Rather, your test is because you are due for a breakthrough. And the greater the test, the bigger the breakthrough. The harder the test, the louder your breakthrough. Will you give up when you're this close? Of course not. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Like Paul, it's time for you to say, Lord, I've got this. I can do this. Strengthen me by your grace. I cannot give up now. I'm going to hang on. I believe in your plans for me. You didn't bring me this far to abandon me. You didn't save me from all that to leave me in this. I didn't successfully cross the threshold to get kicked out the door. I got in so I could own the room. Own the room, my friend. It's a test. Face it head on. The greater one lives in you, and he will help you. Do not fear. Do not worry. Do not quit. You will win. Let me tell you something that someone once told me about the believer's advantage in Christ Jesus. This analogy helped me shape my idea in a helpful way. This beloved servant of God read Romans 8.28 for me, where Paul wrote, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. After reading this, he said to me, Let me paint you a picture of this verse so that you'll always remember it any time the devil attacks your mind with fear and a sense of failure or unworthiness or any such thought. Imagine you belong to a sports team owned by your father, competing in a tournament organized and funded by him, and in competition with rules drawn out by him. Imagine that the linesmen, the referee, the spectators, and the commentators were your siblings along with your teammates, and the only strangers there were your opponents. What are the chances of you losing such a game? He then continued. He said, Do you know that this is a similar situation with which you get to live every day? And if you can lay hold on the understanding and believe it, you will never have a downtime in your life ever again. Don't you know that you're in a game that God has scripted out for you to win? The rules are His creation and are subject to His command to work for you. Do you know that the angels and heavenly hosts are cheering you on to win? The Holy Spirit and the Godhead entirely is conducting the competition in such a way that you win. So even when you make a mistake, they have a means of turning the table to your advantage. Why? Because you're part of the divine family. Although many times I feel overwhelmed with situations and the struggles of life, whenever I remember this analogy of the declaration of Paul about the believer, I feel a spring in my step. Therefore, even when my life seems aimless and off course, with God, I'm still not hopeless. I still win this fight. And this is not just about me or the Apostle Paul or any other specific set of people. No, this great privilege and blessing is the lot of every child of God in Christ Jesus. Will life always be fair to you? Will you always have a trouble-free life? God never promised us anywhere in His Word that life would be so smooth all the time. He never said there would not be crisis. Instead, what He did promise us is that no matter what we go through, He would be with us, and we will overcome by His help. Consider this verse in Isaiah for a moment. Isaiah 43, 2 When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Life will not always make sense, my friend. This is the more reason why you don't conclude on your destiny based on whatever life throws at you. The conclusion of your destiny is in the hands of the one that created you. And his conclusion of you is that no matter what you go through, I have a good plan for you to prosper you and cause you to come out victorious. Once upon a time, you were without God. You lived the way you wanted, did whatever you wanted, went wherever you wanted. It seemed like fun, but you knew you were just hanging in there. There was no hope in your future and no fulfillment in your presence. At that time, you knew that if anything happened to you, you were on your own. Not only so, you also knew that no matter what happened, you had no assurance of God's intervention or of a place with Him in eternity. This is how hopeless we all were apart from Christ. However, here's what happened when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ephesians 2, 12 to 13. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. From the moment you put your faith in Jesus, you became a child of God, a member of God's family. Do you know what this means? It means that God adopted you as his own child and so you're now his responsibility. Now you bear God's name. Now you are his business. You are his family. Now you carry his life, his DNA, his nature, his blood deep within you. Now you are royalty. Now you're not an enslaved worshiper of some God, but a child who adores and loves their father. Now your worship is coming from a place of affection and gratitude than from a place of obligation. Now you are a child of God. Can you say this to yourself until it means something to you? Now I'm a child of God. Now I'm a child of God. Now I'm a child of God. Let me ask you this. Would the Almighty leave His child as a disadvantage 
stranded and without aid? Have you seen anyone more self-aware than someone with royal blood? They're aware of their connection to the throne. The closer their connection, the more confidence in their speech. Most of all, when you meet a crown prince or a princess, they're not so proud and arrogant like one may think, more than they're self-aware of who or what they are by birth. Now, one of the greatest things to happen to you is salvation. Why so? Because it gave you the right to become an heir of God. An heir is someone in the position to inherit something from someone, mostly a parent. Now, everything that God has is in Christ because the Bible has said so. Colossians 2, 9 to 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And if you're in Christ, what does that mean? It means everything is now yours. Repeat that to yourself. Everything that God has is in Jesus. And because I am in Jesus, everything that God has is available to me. I have access to God's grace. I have access to God's favor. I have access to God's power. I have access to all of God. Say it to yourself. This is the lie Satan does not want you to know or accept. He wants you to accept that you have no one. He wants you to believe that you have nothing worth your name. He wants you to believe that you're hopeless. He wants you to believe that all you see around you is all that you are. Oh, but the devil is a liar, my friend. You are the man. You are God's seed. You are his heir. All he has is yours for the taking. If it's in God, it's yours to be taken. Can you imagine a God who beats his chest and asks you to ask him for anything, including nations, and he'd do it? Psalms 2, 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Would this same God not provide your rent? Would this same God not turn your shame into glory? Would this same God not turn your mess into your message? Would he not turn what was meant for evil into good? Would he not deliver you from destruction? Come on, break out of that mindset of defeat and slavery. Trust God. Everything works out for your good, my friend. Everything. He has you covered. When you put your faith in Jesus, you were drawn from afar and brought close. You're not one coming and going anymore. Now you are someone who whispers and he will hear. Once upon a time, sin could not allow our prayers to come to him or his abundance to reach us. But thank God, now he hears even our deepest sighs. He sees our tears. Now there's nothing standing in his way to reaching you when you need him to wipe your tears. Now he's got you. Now you're not alone. He is by your side always. There's so much benefit with being close to God. It is a never-ending list. It is a spiritual position, not a geographical standing. That position is in Jesus Christ. So everywhere you go, he's there. Hear this. Even when you lose that job, lost that promotion, and lost that precious gift you were given, even that time when you looked at yourself and saw nothing good in yourself anymore because your disability, that time when you couldn't further your education like everyone else, that time when it felt like everyone is making progress except you. Now you are close to God. Even that situation isn't hopeless. There's a plan in place for you. Trust me when I tell you that you can trust this God. You can trust this plan. I am living testimony. Satan has got some believers thinking and believing that it's because of your past sins that life has gone so bad for them. Listen to me. There's no doubt that maybe you or your parents made a mistake, rebelled against God's authority, and fell into unwanted situations, and life took an unpleasant turn for you. However, you see that sin? When you became part of God's family, God dealt with it and began the journey to your beautiful restoration. The Phoenix mythology is believed by some to mean many things, and it works for some. No one cares what got the ashes there and what got the bird burnt even if the bird set itself ablaze. But everyone is captivated by the beauty of its new birth. 
it emerges from the ashes a newborn and with new beauty. Do you know that God is still in the business of turning ashes into beauty? Isaiah 61.3 And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. He specializes in the business, dear friend. You see that old garment that the world uses to mock you? Trust God with it. He will turn it into what the world will celebrate about you. If you will trust God with your shame, He'll turn it into glory. If you trust God with your failure, He will turn it into success. If you trust Him with your fear, He takes it away. If you trust Him with your disability, He replaces it with special abilities. He is God, your Creator. Whatever has happened to you or is happening to you right now will work out for your good. Trust Him. You can trust Him. Failure is something every man at some point in his life has to deal with. It is part of life's process. However, as much as it is part of a man's journey, it is not meant to be the end. For the believer, failure is a stepping stone to improvement, betterment, and perfection. For the believer, failure is a call to draw closer to God. Many of us are familiar with failure and we know what it is like to fail even when great efforts are made to avoid it. Sadly, not all of us can say today that we did not let our experience with failure be the end. Not all of us can say, I did not quit, I did not give up, I did not throw in the towel, I did not let the devil win. When we get overwhelmed or when we feel defeated, it is easier to walk out the door than to strive harder it is easier to throw hope out the window in the face of tough situations than to stand strong. However, it is important that we remember that the Lord rarely, if at all He does, demands something that is easy to do. The believer has been called to stand firm in the face of challenges and to soar when storms come. The believer has been called not to quit after failure. Quitting after failure would cause you to miss out on success and fulfilling your purpose. You never know how soon you might start seeing progress, manifestations, and answers if you stay a little longer, if you hold on to hope, if you hang in there and give it a little more time. You see, everything good takes time. It takes time to build something that can outlive a man. It takes time to make great things. Take a look at the things around you, your smartphone, the airplane, electricity, clothes, shoes, your car, the elevator in your building, and so many more were not built in a day. Success, fulfilling purpose, wealth, influence takes time to build and to achieve. God desires that you have good things. He said in 3 John 1-2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. God wants us to succeed in every way, but we must stand strong and not quit after failure. Every time you fail, you are presented with an opportunity to improve because each test, each trial, gives you new information which influences and improves the next model. Not getting it right the first time or the hundredth time is not a sign that you should quit. It's simply a way for you to keep learning how to do it better next time. In whatever area you want to succeed, you can if you put in the work and stay strong when failure hits. The stories we hear of overnight success, rise to fame, big winnings are always preceded by years of struggle and work, and more importantly, years of failing and getting back up again. There are no instant successes. What makes success look instant is the failures that happen in the secret and the rising up from them. There's a long, narrow, and hard road to success. But when success hits, we only focus on the last mile or so. It looks so easy and makes for such a great story. 
that we ignore the miles and miles of obscurity, difficulty, and perseverance required to get that hilltop of glory. Those seemingly overnight stories makes us feel that if we haven't achieved a high level of success in a matter of days or months, we must be doing something wrong. And we are. We're listening to make-believe stories as they were guidelines to how life actually worked. If you give up now, you don't know what you could have achieved and what the world, generations to come, might be missing because of you. Child of God, your purpose and your fulfilling, it is connected to other lives. You cannot afford to fail, or rather you cannot afford to fail and quit. Do not ever come to the decision that your success does not matter or that your losses are too great. Don't listen to the devil who is telling you to give up. He knows that if you don't quit, you will succeed and your successes will influence others one way or the other. The devil wants you to settle for less than what God has in store for you. He wants you to settle for average when God has given us an excellent spirit. Average never changed the world. Average never delivered nations. Average never made kings. Average is not good enough. No, not for you, not for me, and not for God's people. A preacher once said, the life of a Christian can be described in one of four ways. As a journey, as a battle, as a pilgrimage, and as a race. Select your own metaphor, but the necessity to finish is always the same. For if life is a journey, it must be completed. If life is a battle, it must be finished. If life is a pilgrimage, it must be concluded. And if it is a race, it must be finished. You cannot finish your God-given assignment if you quit after failure. Whether it be your first, second, or hundredth experience, we are running a race that must be finished. This race demands that we stand up and run every time we fall. This race demands that we run with hope. This race demands that we be patient and that we be aligned with heaven's mandate. No matter how many times you fail, child of God, do not quit. It may hurt, but stand up again. It may be easier to stay down, but as a child of God, you must stand up again. James 5, 7 through 8 says, Therefore be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the soil being patient concerning it until it receives the early and late rains. You should also be patient, strengthen your heart because the coming of the Lord is near. We are commanded, directed and instructed to become patient and to stand firm and this command is until the Lord's coming. You need to persevere so when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. This is what the scripture says. Yes, it is easier to give up than to wait patiently. James illustrated patience and standing firm to a farmer who waits patiently for his crops to yield and to stand firm in waiting for the rains. A farmer will not abandon his crops because rain has not fallen or because there are still seedlings in the soil. No, he waits until the harvest comes and he is rewarded for his perseverance. In Romans 12:12, 12, 12, the Apostle Paul tells us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. See, life may be throwing you hard blows, but child of God, be joyful, be patient, be faithful, and don't quit. You may have failed and failed and failed, but child of God, do not quit. Success is ahead, and God wants you to know that today you are almost at the end of your journey. Just stay a little more. Whatever it is, you have to do, make sure you get to the finish line. Finish that project, complete that mission, finish that assignment, finish that race, complete that course. Don't quit, no. Don't give up because you have failed. Do not allow failure to be the end of your story. The best things, the things that matter most are the most difficult. A great relationship, a career you can be proud of, a family, serving, innovating, helping others. All those require deep thought, self-control, self-sacrifice, and a willingness to put in a lot of effort over a long amount of time. But what could be better than the results you get from such an effort? 
Some of us are frustrated right now. Some of us cannot seem to understand how God is with us even when we fail. We can't seem to see God's will in our failures, but we are wrong because God's plan sometimes involves a lot of messy paths that lead us to a glorious end. Even when we fail, we are able to see God in it and draw strength from Him rather than question our circumstances. Oppressed by the noonday heat, a tired farmer sat under a walnut tree to rest. Relaxing, he looked at his pumpkin vines and said to himself, how strange it is that God puts such a big heavy pumpkins on a frail vine that has so little strength it has to trail on the ground. And then look up into the cool branches of the tree above him, he added, how strange it is that God put small walnut on such a big tree with big branches so strong they could hold a man. Just then the breeze dislodged the walnut from the tree. The tired farmer wondered no more as he rubbed his head ruefully and said, it is a good thing there wasn't a pumpkin up there instead of a walnut. Hopefully, when the breezes of life blow, you will remember that God, who is great, wise, loving, and powerful, makes no mistakes. He deserves our praise under any circumstances. So child of God, your failure is not a mistake. It is an opportunity to get stronger, to improve, to get better. God makes no mistakes, so if the path he has led you to is full of failures, stay. Every time you try and fail, you learn something about yourself, about life, and you gain experience that can help you to do better next time. God wants us to be like Job, who in Job 13:15 said, though he slays me, yet will I hope in him. Job had seemingly failed in a lot of ways, but he chose to see God in his situation and his confessions proved Job did not quit. His life had, some say, ended, but he got it all back because he did not quit, nor did he walk away from God. James 1-2 says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Allow God to keep you firm. Allow him to clean you up after you fall. Allow him to help you deal with your failures till you are mature and complete, lacking nothing. I mean, you have been trying for years on your own, and now you want to give up? Why not try God? Why not try letting God help you? Listen, you should not quit after failure because not only will it leave you dissatisfied, but it also makes God sad. The world is counting on us believers to do better, go higher, succeed, and change the narrative of a lot of things. Just don't quit after failure. There is a song that goes, he's got the whole world in his hands. We sang that while growing up as children and happily did so. However, as we grew up, many of us seem to forget all about it. Allow me to show you something life-changing today. Let me begin by saying that regardless of what you're facing or how the world is right now, God has everything under control. Nothing is beyond his control right now. Nothing. It may seem otherwise. Maybe you've heard people call him names. Maybe you've heard them say he's not real, he doesn't care, he is powerless or clueless, or he isn't interested in anything. Well, that's their opinion, and God isn't worried about that. The sun doesn't worry about who believes in it or not. It doesn't exist because you do. It exists because it exists. Different people call it different names for different reasons, but that does not affect the sun one bit. It shines when it needs to shine, rises when it needs to, and sets when it needs to. What about the oceans? Whether in drought or not, no one imagines the ocean getting dry. Why? It just can't be. Whether you believe in it or not, there'll still be seas, waves, and ocean tides every day. Proverbs 8, 27 through 29. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth, those things that we know as constants on earth 
are all programs set in motion by God from the beginning. Not a single one has spiraled out of control since the beginning. Imagine power sustaining everything in the right places for ages and ages. The God that made it so is the same creator I'm talking about right now. Today, God wants you to know something. What is that thing God wants you to know? He wants you to know that He is aware of everything you're going through. He is aware of who you are. He is aware of what you have. He is aware. Maybe you think otherwise. Maybe you've been told otherwise. Maybe you think that you have been forgotten, but you aren't. You are never forgotten. Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you. You are my servant, Israel. I will not forget you. I remember speaking to a young lady once while she complained about her business. She was experiencing losses and just didn't know what to do. After listening to her for a while, I asked her gently, have you prayed about it? Have you taken it up as an issue in the place of prayer? She was quite surprised and said, not at all. Then I asked why, to which she said, well, it's not that I don't believe in God. It's just that I don't think God is interested in this area of my life. It took me a while to explain to her that whatever she did, God was interested in it. By whatever, I mean all. I mean everything that makes you tick, that makes you who you are, your private or public life, your business, relationships, your diet, your savings or spending lifestyle, your education, career of choice, exams, jobs, clients, and so on. See what he told the Israelites. Deuteronomy 28, three through eight. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your lifestyle, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hands to. The Lord, your God, will bless you in the land he is giving you. Would a person who is not interested in your entire life be talking like this? Would a person who isn't interested in you say that he knew the plans he had for your life to give you a future and a hope? I strongly doubt that. God does not only want you to know that he hasn't forgotten you and he is interested in you. He also wants you to be still because he has everything under control. Psalms 46.10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What does it mean to be still? To be still means to quiet down the noise around you. What are the noises around you? The noise represents the everything that reminds you of all that is not working in or around your life. The mountain of unpaid bills that you're reminded of every day. The sickness that is refusing to go away. The payment deadline that's fast approaching and you still don't know where the money will come from. The annoying relative that never sees anything good in you the church fellowship that seems not to care, the relationship that seems to be barely surviving, the global crisis that seems to be getting worse. The list can go on. These are all noises. They remind you of what's wrong. They remind you of the pain, the tears, the death and the destruction. Each time you forget them is so blissful, full of relief. Then you can dream. Then you believe you can do anything then nothing seems impossible and life feels so special. However, then they resurface and you're back to the struggles again, desperate, heartbroken, depressed and like an ice sludge, floating there and waiting to melt away until you're forgotten. It's like Peter on that sea, that day walking to go meet Jesus. He felt on top of the world. This was an ordinary fisherman. He hadn't gone to the best school. He was not even educated. All he knew to do was fish. Yet, here he was walking on the water to go meet Jesus. Peter would never forget this moment. He was doing the impossible. However, it was a short-lived bliss. What happened next is like what happens with us many times too. 
Matthew 14, 29 through 30. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. In this moment of victory, all it took to take Peter out was the noise. It brought Peter back to his immediate reality. It was as if everything screamed, Peter, have you forgotten where you are? You're a fisherman for gods, and you should know better. You are a man. Men don't walk on water. No man walks on water. What are you doing? How's this even possible? Then his thoughts answered in agreement, and he took his eyes off Jesus, his peace, his source, and focused it on what he was hearing, the noise. When you focus on the noise, it drowns you. The Bible says immediately he began to sing. It didn't say after a couple of days or hours or minutes. It said instantly. No, how we lose our joy when we are reminded of what isn't working in our lives. How we lose our peace when we remember the bills. God is speaking to you right now. Be still, my child, and know that I am God. I've got this. Shut up everything. Turn down the noise and focus on me. That's right. Focus on me. The bills are yet to be paid. Focus on me. Just the way it takes just one moment to get swallowed up by the waves of your troubles, it takes one moment to clear it all. And it begins by aligning your focus. The noise is only louder because it is all you're listening to. Focus on what I'm saying. Focus on my voice. You're like a child lost in the crowd. You hear a lot of voices, but you can't see me. You've cried for me, called out for me, trying to find me, and it feels like I'm nowhere to be found. But you see, just the way you're calling out to me, I'm also calling out to you. I'm coming to you. My voice is a part of the crowd, but you are unable to hear because you keep moving with the crowd. Before I get to you, you allowed the crowd to carry you like a wave somewhere else. Now you're getting tired and angry and frustrated, but you just have to listen. Filter the noise, stop moving, and just listen. You will hear me. Be still, my child. I'm coming to get you. Sometimes being still means taking a retreat, a break from everything else just to spend time with God through His Word and prayers. Shut off the news. Turn off your internet or the phone. Stay home and just be with God. Remind yourself of His promises. Remind yourself of what He has spoken over your life. Meditate on it yourself. Tell yourself again and again, this is the only truth. Everything else is a lie. I choose not to focus on the afflictions, the disappointments, the pains, the bills and burdens. I choose to focus on God. Abraham was someone who was still before God. Although he was a hundred years old, the Bible says that he refused to consider his old age nor the fact that his wife's womb was dead. He wasn't resigning to fate. He was resigning to God. He was choosing rather to focus on the fact that if God said it, he would do it. He got so still that he became used to being called father of many nations, even when the child had not yet come. When you get so still before God, you begin to echo the language of God's ability above your circumstances. When you get really still before God, you will see how exalted He is above the seemingly impossible situation. You've allowed the waves of your life's crises to overwhelm you. Enough. It's time to go still before God. Why? Because He has everything, including your own crisis, under control. Luke 1, 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill His promises to her. It's not hard for God to change it, and I assure you, as long as you believe in Him, hang in there. At the right time, everything will fall into place. Be still and know that God has everything under control. If I asked you how much control you have over your mind, what would your answer be? You see, one of the greatest revelations of life is that if you do not master your mind, it will master you. We cannot just think about whatever falls into our minds. Yes, you and I do not have control over what falls into our minds, but we have control over what we think about. 
God has given us free will, and that free will exists in our inner man, our soul. So, we have free will on what we foster in our minds, our souls. Absolutely everything begins in the mind. Disobedience, as we see in the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, began as a thought that fostered into an action. In that same light, obedience begins as a thought fostered into action. Sin begins as a thought, holiness and uprightness too. All that we will ever do will begin as a thought. Every battle that we will face will begin in our minds. Defeats and victories start in the mind. This is why we must master our mind and be able to control it to favor in every circumstance. Have you ever considered that perhaps the obstacle between where you are and where you ought to be is in your mind? Have you ever considered that perhaps the greatest obstacle preventing the move of God, or so to say in our lives, is the state of our mind? Child of God, I ask you today, and I want you to answer honestly, do you have control over your mind? You see, it is easy to claim ownership of our minds, so most of us are going to rush to say, yes, I have control. But I tell you, it is what we feed our minds that control it. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. This was God speaking to the children of Israel, and there is something about that verse. God says we should meditate on His Word day and night so that we may do all that He has commanded, for it is only then that we shall be prosperous. God says to meditate. God says to the Israelites, feed on my word day and night so that you can do the right thing, so that you can access my blessings, so that you can know more, so that I can work on you more. Child of God, God says to feed your mind with His word so that it will control it. You see, it is either you feed your mind with the right things or you feed with the wrong things. Believe me, what you feed your mind is what will control it. A mind that is being fed with God's Word is going to be controlled by God's Spirit, and a man led by God's Spirit is going to live according to God's desires. Romans 8, 5-8 says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the flesh cannot please God. The only way to please God is to do what God says, and the way to do what God says is by constantly feeding our minds with His Word. Romans 12.2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Our minds can win us victories before any battle begins. For instance, imagine you are going for a job interview and you went to bed last night thinking about how you probably will not get the job or how you are not good enough for it. Chances are you will not get the job and you will go home feeling depressed and defeated, thinking that you were right. The reality is, you did not get that job because your mind did not see a victory. You allowed yourself to think and dwell on negativity before the interview came. If you sit for a test and all you think about is how you are going to fail, then you will fail that test. This is the problem believers face. We are quick to listen to the devil and quick to think negative thoughts and it affects our lives in such a way that it makes it seem as though God is not with us. You are sick, and God can heal, but all you ever think about is how the sickness is going to kill you. When we glorify our struggles in our mind, they become so big. But when we see them as they are, struggles and nothing more, then they become nothing more than that. Listen, who we are is not what we face. We are not defined by our problems. 
Who we are in Christ is who we are through and through. But when we allow our minds to weigh the things of the flesh and the setbacks of life, we cannot access or live out the victories Jesus already won for us. If we can think it, we can have it. Our minds are where the greatest battles in life are fought, and our winning them is completely up to us. Why? All that we will ever need has been provided at the cross. Every kind of victory that we will ever need has been won at the cross, but it takes a believing mind to access it. Child of God, do not think the things that you are not. You are great, so don't think yourself small. You are blessed, so don't think yourself poor. You are healthy, so don't think yourself sick. Even if the situation you are in says something otherwise, let your mind see better, and you will have better. We see from Scripture that Jesus Christ always gave thanks before a miracle because He knew God would do what He asked. Even when Jesus was faced with impossible situations, His mind saw further than the present, and so His actions were in line with God's will, and His mouth gave thanks. The devil wants to get a hold of your mind because he knows it is a crucial part of you. That is why he comes to whisper lies and to fill our heads with confusion. He knows if he can make you not believe, then God's word will not be fulfilled in your life. The devil is not after your money or your job or your house. He is after your mind, and you cannot let him win. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Dear believer, I want you to see that your mind is precious. I want you to decide to take every thought captive, as the Apostle Paul says, to the obedience of Christ. Having control of your mind is vital, for we are at war against things that are not of the flesh. So the battle may be in the form of a rejected proposal, or a bad doctor's report, or a bad marriage. But listen to me. In the battlefield of your mind, you must fight and win. Only then will it be revealed in the realm of the physical. Remember, our weapons are not of the flesh, and the battlefield of life is in the mind. If you lose in your mind, you will lose in the physical. If your mind only sees an obstacle and never a way out, then a way out won't come. Listen, the answer you have been waiting for has come already, but it is in your spirit. It takes your mind to bring it to the realm of the physical. Control your mind. Control your mind. Child of God, you cannot afford to not have control over your mind. Without control over your mind, you are at risk, and you are open to the attacks of the enemy. Remember, John 10.10a says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. His primary target is your mind. Your mind is where the arrows are being shot at. This is why we have to consistently feed it with the Word of God. The Word of God is an armor our minds can wear to fight. The Word of God enables us and strengthens us in battle. It is our weapon, our weapon in pulling down strongholds. Our minds are where we win before we even go out into the world. So Proverbs 4.23 tells us to watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Keep watch over your mind, child of God. Watch over your mind and guard it, for every battle in life will begin and end in your mind. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Fix your eyes on Jesus and let your mind be saturated with the things that God says alone. That battle you are currently fighting, that mess you are in can be won and be put to an end if you take control over your mind. Glory to Jesus, for we do not have to go on this journey alone. The Lord is not just with us, but He is also with us to help us. But we have to ask Him to, and we will have to be open to receiving His help. Then we must meditate on the Word of God, 
for it is the manual we have been given to tackle life's worst. So for that person who is struggling with negative thoughts, I want to assure you, God is with you to help you. And for that person who has accepted defeat and smallness, I want you to know that God did not create you to be small, so stop believing the devil's lies. And for that person in a pit right now, hear me well, the tables can turn if you take control over your mind.